After almost a decade, the Halo TV series has finally dropped, at least in some countries, and naturally, Halo canon is here to break it all down. Before we dive in, though, keep in mind that the Halo TV series is set in its own timeline, known as the Silver Timeline. When I reference the lore and canon of the games, books, and most other Halo media, I'll refer to that as Core Canon. Additionally, when I discuss deviations from Core Canon, don't take that as a criticism unless specified. The point of this video is just to talk about the differences between the show and Core Canon. With that, let's begin. The episode opens on the planet of Madrigal, portrayed here similarly to Arlia, a desert world from Core Canon. Madrigal first appeared in the book Halo the Cold Protocol by Tobias Buckle, the book also introducing the Rubble, an asteroid colony we'll see later in the series, and Spartan Grey Team, a group of rather independent Spartan 2s. Silver, Grey, see what I'm getting at? Madrigal is an outer colony, traditionally meaning it was founded during the second wave of humanity's extrasolar expansion. Such colonies are often less well-off than inner colonies, and their residents often have a disdain for Earth at best. The technology of such worlds can be radically different too, something the TV show does an excellent job of portraying, especially once we're in the city. Be it the kit-bashed vehicles, such as the spade-looking one, largely outdated rifles and weaponry, or just their general equipment. Although, there are some recognizably Halo vehicles in the mix. I could swear this one was based on some concept art or something, but I haven't been able to find it, so I might be wrong. In the opening shot, Madrigal is referred to as a Tier 4 planet, possibly a reference to the Forerunner technology tiers of Core Cannon. Introduced as part of Halo 3's Bestiarum, a bonus included with the limited and legendary editions of the game, the tiers ranged from 7, referring to pre-industrial civilizations, up to 1, aka the level of the Forerunners. There was also a theoretical Tier 0 for the Precursors, enigmatic beings who seeded the Milky Way with life. A Tier 4 civilization would be in the Space Age, aka able to leave the planet with relative ease and regularity, which feels like it fits for Madrigal. Incidentally, modern humanity would fall under Tier 5, the Atomic Age, and the human civilization of Halo would fall under Tier 3, Spacefaring. The year is also established as 2552, the last year of the war in Core Canon. Also in Core Canon, most of Earth's outer colonies have been wiped out by 2535, though not all of them. Oddly, the show seems to give the impression that the Covenant are largely unknown, which in Core Canon would be next to impossible by 2552. But, new timeline, new rules. Finally, though, we come to a settlement on this world, an outpost that ships out harvested deuterium, or heavy hydrogen, which is used for starship fuel. Madrigal, as we learn later, has the highest concentration of heavy water, water containing deuterium, in human space. Not just good for starships, but also... The drugs. In the outpost's center is a space elevator, which presumably brings the deuterium up to a ship or a dock or something. As we see later, the lines can be retracted during emergencies. The outpost itself reflects the multiculturalism of Halo's future, featuring Adobe-style housing alongside a lot of Korean and East Asian influences. Inside the outpost, we meet the colonists, or as they're labeled by the UNSC, insurrectionists. In core canon, there are many insurrectionist cells, some far more violent than others, but the UNSC often labels them, and treats them, all the same. Something the show also makes clear later on. As a group of innies, a slang term for insurrectionists, plays cards and exposes about the state of the galaxy, their unfair treatment by the UNSC, desires for independence, fighting marines, we can spot Burn Gorman's character, Vishner Grath, talking about the plight of Madrigal on Intersystem News, a news network that pops up a few times in core canon. Behind him, we can see a closed fist symbol, variations of which are common among insurrectionist cells. Below Venture, we can spot a few familiar companies as stock info scrolls across the TV screen. Acheron Security, AMG Transport Dynamics, and Lethbridge Industrial. There's also one labeled DSSS, which might be a company called Dasis. One more company also appears, one new to the lore, Zedon, abbreviated as XDN. Zedon Industries, which appears to be named after the Zedon River in Laos, is the company that owns this outpost, their logo appearing all over the outpost's equipment. The scene continues, building up the conflict with the UNSC and, moreover, establishing the threat of the Spartans as the Innies see it. They even say, Ah, but Janka, there's another difference between Spartans and Marines. Mm -hmm. Marines can be killed. <laughs> of course, referencing that oh-so-famous line, Spartans never die. By the way, I need these playing cards. I am a sucker for a sick set of playing cards. 
Outside the city, we find Quan Ah with a group of friends, apparently looking for a local narcotic that's enhanced by the planet's deuterium abundance. However, Quan soon discovers a group of Covenant digging nearby. The elites open fire, and damn does the show get graphic. People literally explode when hit with plasma shots, the superheated gas instantly vaporizing any liquid it comes in contact with, including the liquid in the human body. Brutal. I love too how they keep the elites hidden during this introduction. Quan is soon the only survivor, using a flare to alert the outpost before making her way there just as the gates close. She warns her father, General Jin Ha, about the alien threat before taking shelter with other kids and the elderly. As the colonists prepare to defend their home, we get a good look at the turret Chief will utilize later on, which we can see has a Colonial Military Authority tag on it. The Colonial Military Authority, more often called the Colonial Military Administration, or CMA, was the military arm of the Colonial Administration Authority, or CAA, a governing body created by the Unified Earth Government to help oversee the Earth's colonies, particularly the Outer Colonies. In core canon, the CMA and CAA became very sympathetic to the insurrectionist cause, eventually leading to both being folded into the UNSC. It isn't long before the elites literally arrive at the doors of the outpost, giving a neighborly warp warp before laying waste to everyone and everything. We get a close-up look at the elites and their armor, most sporting the gray armor that we saw in the trailers, but here being led by what I assume is an elite major or maybe even a zealot. The armor isn't bad, especially in motion, but the red armored elite's helmet isn't exactly my favorite design. It's also kind of odd that he has no forearm protection, especially since the other elites do. It's kind of that Halo 4 and 5 syndrome all over again. In a later scene, we can see the elite's shoulder pauldron has some Covenant text on it. I'd love to translate it for y'all, but it doesn't seem to line up with any known version of the Covenant language, or at least not completely. Back to the action, though. The Innies try to defend themselves, but their guns are largely ineffective. In core canon, even up-to-date UNSC weaponry at the start of the war wasn't always that effective. In response, most standard-issue weapons started using armor-piercing and or full-metal jacketed rounds to some degree or another, rounds these people probably don't have access to. That all said, the 50 cal machine gun not doing more is a bit of a problem when contrasted with a certain later scene, but we'll get there when we get there. The elites continue to rip and tear through the colonists, the red one even bodying the car Jin Ha is riding, and another detonating some fusion coils as they lay waste. They even cut down the children and elderly without mercy. The show is damn brutal. A UNSC D-80 Condor, essentially a modified Pelican with a slipspace drive, soon appears in the sky, Master Chief and Silver Team deploying from it. The Spartans go to work cutting down the elites via whatever means necessary and available, from pipes to an enemy plasma pistol. This show does Spartan action right, in my opinion. During the fight, and even later scenes, we're treated to first-person shots where we get to see the show's version of a Spartan's heads-up display, or HUD. It comes complete with weapon and grenade icons, shield bar, and radar. The HUD seems to take heavy inspiration from Halo 4, my personal favorite HUD design, and it's running BIOS version 3.43, a reference to 343 Industries. The HUD also has some newer features for those who only play the games, such as automatically marking enemy elites, insurrectionists, and allies. When it does mark a fellow Spartan, a status indicator also appears on the Chief's HUD. The Chief, and later Silver Team, quickly go to work engaging the elites, showing the contrast between UNSC weaponry and the scraps left to the Outer Colonies. Although, when the Chief rips the machine gun from its mount, it's suddenly a lot deadlier than it was before, almost looking like it's firing completely different rounds now. Where the bullets were little more than a nuisance before, they cut down the elites with relative ease. Short of an oversight for the sake of action, my best guess would be that these elites' shields were worn down by the fight, but who knows. Speaking of shields, though, just before taking the turret, the Chief is forced into cover when his shields drop. When they recharge, we hear that oh-so-iconic sound. Which, on that note, the sound design for this show is fantastic. They'll very often use classic Halo sounds wherever possible, and I deeply appreciate that. And lastly, at least for this fight, one elite directly identifies the Chief as Demon. While the Master Chief himself would be referred to as THE Demon by the Covenant, Demon also applied to all Spartans, at least in core canon. For example, remember Grey Team, the Spartan team I mentioned a while back? They were collectively known as the Demon Three. As the battle comes to a conclusion, the Red Elite tries to go after Quan Ha, but is distracted by her father. Interestingly, the Elite's shields are still down in this scene, almost like they either don't regenerate or they take a fairly long time to regenerate. 
Still, no shields aren't much of a problem for this elite. By the way, the energy sword here, if anyone is interested, seems to be based on the Halo Reach design, same as the plasma pistol before. The plasma rifle, interestingly, seems to be a new design. After the battle, the Chief contacts Fleet Command, as in Fleet Command on Reach, to fill them in on the situation. In the core canon, this would have basically been impossible, as UNSC faster than light communication wasn't really a thing until after the Human Covenant War. Here, however, it seems like UNSC FTL tech in general, not just communication, is far more advanced. Just before the opening rolls, the Chief and Silver team move out to find the Covenant landing site, leaving Quan alone, showing just how machine-like the Spartans are at this point. We then get to the opening for the show, which I absolutely love. We see the Chief as his armor forms around him, and behind him we can see Forerunner tech and lettering, similar to the artifact the Chief discovers later. Finally, we get the Halo logo, which is modeled after the newer version of the logo, but, at least to me, evokes something of the older Halo CE logo, at least to a degree. After the opening, Silver Team moves on the Covenant landing site, giving us a better look at the show's version of a Phantom dropship. Vonik-134 and Riz-028 are ordered to clear the ship of hostiles, while the Chief and Kai-125 investigate what the Covenant were digging for. Before they separate, Vonik gives the Chief his DMR. It's a small detail, but given that Vonik is about to board a Phantom, a ship with not a lot of interior space, it makes sense to hand over the DMR to someone who might need it more. Inside the caves, which Kai refers to the structure as not a natural formation, a callback to that infamous line from Halo CE, the Chief and Kai encounter the Forerunner artifact the Covenant had been digging for. There's some kind of Covenant device nearby, but it doesn't resemble anything from the core canon, at least not that I could find. As a lone surviving elite watches, initially prepared to fire on the demons, the Chief touches the artifact, triggering it and the surrounding cave structure. We'll talk more about that later on, as the important thing for now are the visions that are shown to the Chief when he touches the artifact, what we learn are his suppressed childhood memories. Now, this is a fair deviation from core canon. While Spartans were still brainwashed into fighting for the UNSC, their memories were never suppressed, most Spartan twos making peace with what had been done to them. Not many Spartan twos had memories from before their time as Spartans, but that was simply the result of nature. How many of you have a ton of clear memories from before you were six? I can't say I have too many, I could probably count them on one hand. Anyway, Kai pulls the chief away from the object, and the observing elite flees the caves, engaging its cloaking as it exits, and managing to escape in a banshee. We learn later that this elite is a Kaidon, or a clan leader among the Sangheili, the elites. Outside the cave, the Chief orders Silver Team to commandeer the Phantom and take it back to Fleet Command on Reach, which in core canon would be a violation of the Cole Protocol. The Cole Protocol was developed to prevent the Covenant from finding human colonies and, among its many articles, was a rule against bringing Covenant tech directly to human worlds, to paraphrase. The Chief says he'll take Quan Ah and follow in the Condor, which Kai notes as a violation of protocol. So we're definitely doing a version of the Chief Goes Rogue a la Halo 5, though with much better fight choreography. The next scene brings us to the planet Reach, the UNSC's military powerhouse second only to Earth. The turrets defending this city look like they were pulled directly from the Halo Wars series. The skies above are filled with pelicans, condors, probably other aerial vehicles, and Halberd-class destroyers. When we get a close-up of White Tower, the central structure in the background, we also see an unknown class of frigate. In her lab, Dr. Halsey watches Master Chief's helmet footage before she's interrupted by Admiral Margaret Parangoski. In the core canon, Perengoski was the head of the Office of Naval Intelligence and one of the people who gave the go-ahead on the Spartan II program. Perengoski is one of the few people that Halsey truly fears, something that definitely comes across in this show. As the two talk about the recent events of Madrigal, Perengoski mentioning the UNSC Security Committee wanting to shut down the Spartan II program, something not exactly shocking even in core canon, we get a few good shots of Halsey's display screen, which contains, among other things, direct excerpts from Dr. Halsey's journal a bonus included with the limited and legendary editions of Halo Reach. Behind Halsey, we can also spot two sets of Mjolnir, though we never get a clear look at them. One of them kinda looks like Centurion to me, but again, it's hard to tell. Perengoski has a very distinct look to her, especially in contrast to other officers, though you can still spot the four stars marking her as an admiral here. After discussing the artifact and the survivor, Perengoski notices another of Halsey's experiments, what ends up being a Flash clone of the Doctor herself. This clone will eventually be used to create Cortana, just like in the core canon. Unlike in the core canon, however, this clone doesn't appear to be visibly altered, whereas core canon Halsey modified the genes of her clones to emphasize brain growth. And yeah, she had multiple clones. 
We learn later that this clone was made for the, quote, Cortana system, another deviation from core canon. Normally, smart AI like Cortana choose their names when they are born, so to speak. Perengoski admonishes Halsey over the clone, relaying that what she is doing is illegal. In core canon, the cloning of humans is a violation of the UN Colonial Mortal Dictata Act, and the cloning of the Spartan II candidates was a major point of contention for Perengoski. Given her attitude towards this Cortana system, I'm wondering if the creation of Cortana might be done behind Perengoski's back in the Silver Timeline. Meanwhile, at the Legion of... Oh, whoops, uh, wrong franchise. The show then cuts to High Charity, the Covenant Holy City, with tons of ships coming and going all around it. Inside, we find the High Prophet of Mercy, a pair of honor guards behind him, as he meets with Maquis, the human in the Covenant. And I have to say, the Prophets, the Sanchayum, look damn good here. We also get to see the Golden City of High Charity in better detail, along with the Forerunner ship Anodyne Spirit, which rests at the city's center and powers all of High Charity. Like in Core Canon, we can see ships moving around the city, demonstrating its true scale. Anyway, Mercy and Maquis discuss the object on Madrigal, which Maquis apparently predicted the location of. How she made this prediction isn't clear in the first episode, but I wouldn't be surprised if it involved another type of Forerunner artifact, a luminary. These devices had a number of functions, though primarily the Covenant used them for tracking Forerunner artifacts. Mercy additionally notes that the Chief was able to, quote, bring the artifact to life like Maquis, almost implying that the High Prophets are unaware that all humans, at least in core canon, should be able to do this. I suspect that either the ability to activate Forerunner tech is rarer in the Silver Timeline than core canon, or Mercy and the other Prophets are lying about how special Maquis is. Perhaps Maquis was witnessed activating Forerunner tech by members of the Covenant, so the Prophets had to accept her in, but in doing so, made the claim that she was exceptional, or something along those lines. We have eight more episodes to find out, though hopefully it won't take that long. We cut back to the Chief and Quan, now aboard the Condor and headed for Reach. I love the muted sound design for space. Quan is soon contacted via hologram by Miranda Keys, who is more of a scientist in the show, studying the Covenant and their technology. Miranda tries to get Quan to make an appeal to other colonies, hoping to get them to focus on fighting the Covenant, but Miranda fails her persuasion check. I think that it would go a long way to putting aside whatever these politicians are bickering about and helping us focus on the real war. Right after this, there's a fun Mass Effect Easter egg calling for... Skillian here is a reference to the Skillian Verge from Mass Effect, a highly disputed territory along the borders of human and Batarian space. Commander Shepard would take part in the Skillian Blitz, a conflict initiated by the Batarians. Skipping forward a bit, the UNSC now aware of the Chief's memories resurfacing, the Chief decides to run a diagnostic on himself. We get a full readout of the results, which mention a couple things lore fans might recognize. The refractive coating, which helps the armor plates disperse plasma shots when shielding is inactive, and the gel layer, a layer that allows the undersuit to conform to the user's body and regulates temperature, among other things. Meanwhile, at Fleet Command, we finally get to meet Captain Jacob Keyes as he talks to his daughter, the subject of Halsey coming up quick. You can really hear the disdain in Miranda's voice for her mother, always referring to her as Halsey, which is pretty in line with core canon. Jacob then informs Miranda that Quan has been designated as Article 72, meaning she's going to be terminated for the greater good. Back on the Condor, Quan informs the Chief that they've actually met before, as the Chief was one of the Spartans who killed Quan's mother. Seems she was at a peaceful meeting of colonists when Spartans came busting in and eliminated everyone present. According to the Chief, their original orders were to take out the Organizer, but the orders changed. While I'm sure there's more to this story that we'll discover later in the series, it does reflect the true horrific nature of the UNSC. And to seal the deal, the Article 72 order comes through. In response, the Chief kills the video feed to Reach, the memories awakened by the artifact, and the talk with Quan having rattled him. Discovering this, Fleet Command begin lowering the oxygen levels in both the Condor and Chief's armor. Luckily, the Chief is able to reactivate the oxygen. On Reach, the alarm is raised, and Perengoski calls for a full Soren protocol, referencing the original rogue Spartan, Soren 066. We'll have to wait for another episode to meet him, however. The next several scenes are just visual porn for Halo fans. Marines flood out of their barracks and grab BRs, pilots looking like their Halo 4 incarnations prepare pelicans, and outside, a mass driver like the one Noble Six used in Halo Reach deploys. 
Meanwhile, Silver Team re-equip their armor with help from the Brock armor mechanism and are ordered by Dr. Halsey to secure, rather than kill, the Master Chief. This scene really shows just how dangerous Dr. Halsey can be. On the Condor, Quan wakes up and has an understandable freakout. To calm her down, the Chief takes a play from George 052's book, removing his helmet. And damn what a moment. Throughout the episode, the show made sure not to show any Spartan faces to really sell the idea that they're simple machines. Now, we get to see the man beneath the armor. This won't land for everybody, but I enjoyed Pablo's portrayal both with and without his helmet. I also really love how the helmet kind of opens when he removes it, similar to Halo 4's depiction of Mjolnir. This scene also confirms that the Chief is wearing Mark VI Mjolnir. There was some debate prior to premiere whether they'd still use the Mark system in the show. As the Condor is brought to Reach, the Chief and Quan are able to wrestle control away, but get shot down by an EMP from the Mass Driver which I thought was a pretty cool use of the weapon. The Chief then grabs the Forerunner artifact, this time giving us a much clearer view of the holograms it projects. The center contains the Reclaimer symbol, Reclaimers being any human that can interact with Forerunner tech. Around it we can see various Forerunner scripts. The outermost script looks to be the same type seen on Sandtrap. Then we have these symbols which line up with a version of Forerunner numbers, though they seem to be just random numbers. Finally, around the Reclaimer symbol itself, we can read Scan, and end. The artifact is scanning John to confirm he's a Reclaimer. This time we get a more complete set of memories, showing who are presumably John's mother and father, along with a white dog, and a young John himself. The flashback ends showing a drawing of John's from childhood, identical to the artifact he's touching now. The artifact showing up in his memories like this could be an early hint at the concept of a geish, or gene song, basically information, instructions, even memories, coded into the DNA and passed down for generations until conditions are met that unlock the geish. Gene songs are, in core canon, how humans can so easily interact with Forerunner tech. Anyway, a huge surge of energy erupts from the artifact, briefly shutting down Fleet Comm Tower, powering up the Condor, and allowing John and Quan to escape. And that brings the first episode of the Halo TV series to a close. Those were all the Easter eggs and references I could find, but if there are any I missed, let me know. So far, I'm pretty okay with the TV series. The action is fantastic and very clear, the acting is all around great, the cast are doing a fantastic job, the set design screams Halo, and the CG is overall pretty solid. The music has its moments and the camera work is solid, and while there can be some awkward moments in the Mjolnir armor, I'm pretty happy with that too. My main issue at the moment is with the story, but it's only episode one. And I'll be honest, I'm not really watching the Halo TV series for its story. So even if the story tanks, so long as the action and acting remain solid, I'll probably be on board for the long haul. But we'll see. Naturally, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Look forward to more Halo content, both TV related and not. This has been Halo Canon, and I'll see y'all next time. Thank you once again for watching Canonites. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, maybe even share it around, both of which help the channel. And if you aren't subscribed already, consider becoming a fellow Canonite and hitting that notification bell so you won't miss any future videos. Halo Canon now has a Discord server, which you can find linked in the description box below. If you like discussing any aspect of Halo's lore, well, that's what we specialize in. Thank you all once more, and keep on being awesome.